Welcome all of you chirpers. Thank you so much for joining our sixth episode of Chirp's How To Beginning Backyard Birding Series. Today we're going to focus on identifying birds. We're going to talk about some bird ID criteria, optics, and a citizen science. And as mentioned, this is the sixth episode in our series, but all of the videos are on our Chirp YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and watch more of this series, you're more than welcome to. Also, if you like what you see today, all of the items mentioned are found online or in-store at Chirp Nature Center. And the best part is after this presentation, you can take a short quiz, maybe like two minutes, and be entered in to win a grand prize, which is gonna be one of the items featured in our tutorial today. So here is Randy, the owner of Chirp, here to help you make your backyard birds happy. Take it away. Thank you, Tori. And thank you for joining us. No matter your skill level, today we're going to walk through the steps and the resources you can use to help better your birding. So here's an overview for what we're going to do right now. First, we're going to go over bird identification criteria. That's going to be step number one. Step number two is we're going to talk about the importance of optics and how they improve your birding experience. And step number three is we are going to talk about how you can participate in citizen science and share your sightings with the scientific community as well as your friends and family. Speaking of sightings, you may spot Joy helping us today. She's keeping us on track as we fly through our how-to tutorial. So first, let's hear from you. How long have you been birding? Are you brand new or have you been identifying birds for years? Post your answers in the comments section. Okay, to quickly identify birds in your backyard and beyond, let's start with step number one, bird identification criteria. Every bird has distinct characteristics and by categorizing a bird's unique features, you can more easily narrow down its species and ultimately put a name on it. We've created a list of these bird identification criteria so that you know what to look and listen for when you're identifying a bird. So first, pay attention to the habitat. Second, listen for the sound. Third, note the behavior. Fourth, consider its size and shape. And fifth, finally but not least, look at the color pattern. And you'll notice we have those in a specific order with the color pattern last, and that's on purpose. We'll explain that as we go along. Use this phrase to help you remember these criteria, HSBSC, or happy singing birds sit and chirp. The H being for habitat, the S for sound, the B for behavior, the S for size and shape, and the C for the color pattern. So happy singing birds sit and chirp helps you recall the criteria once you have spotted a bird. Okay, now let's break down each of these five criteria. Whether you're birding in your backyard or traveling to new areas, the first criteria to look at is the surrounding habitat. A bird's habitat includes everything they need to eat, mate, nest, and survive. Uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology breaks habitats down into four types. We have forested habitats, aquatic habitats, scrub, shrub habitats, and open habitats. Birds um, may change these habitats based on the season or their migration pattern or food availability. You can always check a bird migration website, website like BirdCast which helps you determine if the bird you've seen is in the area at the current time. And the link to BirdCast will include um, in our video description, so you can check it out um, after this how-to. Okay, now that you may um, actually hear a bird before you see one, um, the second bird identification criteria is sound. Every type of bird makes a variety of sounds. There are alarm calls that warn of danger. There are begging calls used by younger birds when they want to eat. There are contact calls. 
to signal uh, birds uh, amongst one another. And then there are songs which birds use to attract mates. For example, let's listen to the mountain chickadee. First, we will hear their song and then their call. And notice how different they are. Okay, it's valuable to listen to a bird's sound and then see the bird. This helps associate the sound that you're hearing with the visual appearance and kind of burn it into your uh, brain. I find that's a helpful technique. So once a bird is in view, the next criteria to use to narrow down an identification is to watch their behavior. Often a bird's behavior is associated with a specific bird species, so noticing a bird's behavior provides an important clue to what a bird may be. When you're watching the bird's behavior, pay attention to how it sits, how it moves, how it flies. Also notice its feeding or foraging strategy. For example, pygmy nuthatches forage tree trunks for insects, but you don't sip typically see a red-tailed hawk darting around a tree trunk searching for food. Instead, birds of prey hunt by flying overhead, uh, searching for prey uh, down on the ground. Noticing a bird's behavior can help you differentiate between birds, even if they physically look and sound similar. All right, another criteria to help identify a bird is to note, number four, their size and shape. First, compare the bird's size to birds you know well. Is it, for instance, larger than a sparrow, a robin, a crow? Also consider the various body part sizes relative to uh, one another. Uh, for example, is the bird's bill long in relationship to the head, or is the bill short and stocky? Um, the violet green swallow's bill is only about five millimeters long, but an Anna's hummingbird, similar to what we just saw, their bill is typically 18 millimeters long, almost 20% of their body length. So um, get an idea of how different body parts are relative to one another. Um, also, when you're considering size and shape, notice the overall shape of the bird. Look at the head shape, the net, neck length, the body shape, Focus on the silhouette of the bird. Um, and still at this point, we're not getting overly distracted by the color of the bird because uh, we're saving that for last. So we've observed the habitat, the sound, the behavior, and the size and shape of a bird to narrow down our identification. The final criteria to look for when identifying a bird is their color pattern. And this incidentally is what people often focus on first, but we find that this process of narrowing through these criteria actually gets you more quickly to a more accurate identification. So when you're looking at color pattern, note not only the colors that you see, but the relationship of the colors and color patterns. For example, is the entire head a solid color or just the top cap? Are there stripes uh, above or below or through the eyes? Is the chest a different color or pattern? Look for outrageous colors um, so that you can um, set birds apart from uh, one another. Uh, don't focus on every detail you see in a picture because a bird's appearance changes with the seasons. Also, male and female birds of the same species are typically similar but often uh, different. All right, so well done. Those are the five criteria for bird identification. So next time you are trying to identify a bird, remember H, S, B, S, C. H for the habitat, S for the sound, B for the behavior, S for the size and shape, and C for the color pattern. Or you can just use the phrase, happy singing birds sit and chirp to recall these bird identification criteria. Okay, great. These criteria are a helpful tool when identifying birds, especially when the criteria are used in collaboration with the field guide, which we're gonna talk about next. Like birds, field guides come in all shapes and sizes to help with the identification process. Let's talk about a few of our favorites. The first one, our favorite one, 
is the Peterson's Field Guide. There are a variety of guides for geographic ranges. Um, in this uh, particular guide, there's a North America one, a Central North America one. Uh, this one's the Western North America one, and this is our favorite because we're in the West. And um, one of the reasons that I like this is there's a quick reference guide in the beginning. So if you know that it's uh, a J, for instance, you go to the J section and then it quickly takes you uh, to that part of uh, the guidebook. Um, also, there are illustrations. I prefer identifying birds from illustrations because the illustrations actually accentuate certain key characteristics of the bird, and I find it's easier than using photographs often. And this book I like because it comes with range maps, and it's happened more than once, I will admit, that I'm looking at a bird going, oh, I think it's one of these, and then I look at the range map and I'm thinking, no, it's not, because it's nowhere near where I am right now. So, some of the reasons uh, why we like this guide. Some guides are more uh, specific in their regionality. Um, there is a um, Birding for Beginners uh, guide here that's specific just to California. Um, you can also get a great guide that is more specific for species, like this Birds of Prey of the West, another one of our favorites for identifying raptors. And if you're a more experienced birder, you can hone your identification skills um, with this Kaufman's Field Guide to Advanced Birding, another good one. When you are birding in the boonies, let's say you want to pack light but still carry a smaller guide, you can look for pocket guides like this one um, that uh, is smaller, easier uh, to car carry around. It fits in your backpack, um, but it still has a lot of specific species um, information in it. But if this is still too heavy, there are even smaller um, guides like these pamphlets, uh, nests and eggs, um, they go on gardening for birds, bird feeders and food, um, waterfowl ID series, birding 101, birds of California, trees. <laughs> okay, thank you Joy. <laughs> so, um, Thanks, I really feel so prepared now, especially when it comes to trees. So when you're birding, a bird example, I'm sorry, a bird checklist is also very helpful. Um, Chirp's Wild Bird List uh, right here has all the birds that are specific to our San Bernardino um, mountains uh, here in Southern California. I find that um, lists like this, which should be available at uh, your local wild bird store, hopefully, um, is helpful to help you uh, narrow down. Also, it's a good way uh, for you to keep track of the birds um, that you've identified. Um, this chirp list has a little spot where you can um, mark them. So uh, we give out a lot of these. They're very helpful uh, to our local birders. So do you have a favorite birding guide you've found especially helpful? Share it with us and let us know in the comments, please. Uh, another bird identification resource or tool uh, comes in the form of phone apps. It's like carrying a bookshelf in your pocket. There's the Audubon app. eBird is great for tracking bird sightings. There's the Merlin Bird ID app, which helps you identify birds um, all around the world. Great tools. Um, be aware that although these birding apps are very convenient, these technologies do rely on batteries and internet connections, which don't always work all the time everywhere. Um, and if you do prefer your electronics to help you with your bird identification, I find it's a really good idea to have a good old fashioned backup, um, just in case. So we just gained a bunch of bird identification knowledge. Let's put our skills to the test by identifying a bird together. So, you see this bird at your feeder. Remember the phrase, happy singing birds sit and chirp. And then you use the bird identification criteria we just talked about. We'll notice its habitat, and in this case, a forested habitat with lots of trees and shrubs. We're listening for its sound, and if you can hear it, it's got sort of a, a, a bright 
chipper of a sound, uh, the whistling of a songbird. Um, watch its behavior. It might be uh, foraging on the ground or eating sunflower seeds from your feeder. Um, observe its size and shape, um, the thick bill, um, it's stocky, it's probably smaller, uh, maybe close to the size of a robin, and then note its color pattern. It's got a cinnamon orange body, a black head, and a black and white uh, set of wings. And then if you use your beginning, beginning uh, birder's guide, this one's organized by color, I would go to the orange section and um, I would then have identified the black-headed grosbeak. So I see these birds at my feeders all the time. Uh, they're one of our favorites. Uh, they're very stately to us. Uh, we've nicknamed them Lord and Lady Grosbeak. Uh, so that's just an example of how the bird identification works. So we've used these criteria and the field guides to identify birds. Let's move on to another important element, a key element of birding, and that would be step number two, the importance of optics. So you certainly can identify a lot of birds with the naked eye, but bird watching binoculars are almost essential because they help bring the birds into focus at further distances and they magnify the details and they really make birding much more pleasant, much easier. And binoculars range in price from 50 bucks on the low end uh, to $2,000 or more. You can spend a lot depending on the quality of the optics. Um, when you're buying binoculars, uh, the first thing that you want to look for is the magnification power and the lens diameter. Binoculars are characterized by a set of numbers. The first number um, typically would be like an 8 or a 10, and um, that is the strength of magnification. And then the second number, if we're saying like 8 by 42s, the second number, the 42, is the diameter of the lens, so the size, how big the lens is. So the first number is the magnification, how close it brings things to you. So an 8 or 10 power magnification brings things 8 or 10 times closer to you. And then the second number, let's say the 42, is the diameter of the lens. The recommended size for beginning birders is an 8 to 10 magnification and a 30 to 42 millimeter lens uh, diameter. This range is a good balance between performance, size, uh, and weight, and that's why they're most popular. So here I have a pair of Diamondback 8x32s. It has the 8 magnification power, the 32 millimeter uh, diameter lens, and it's a great beginning pair of binoculars for only $270. They're nice and compact. They're weatherproof. We could go on, but a great pair to start out with. Second element to look for uh, when you're considering binoculars is the overall quality. Typically the higher the quality, the higher the price. Seems kind of obvious. The benefits of more expensive binoculars are that they would typically have clearer, crisper, brighter images. Uh, the glass, the optics are better, uh, so they allow more light through. Um, they have higher quality lens and lens coatings. Um, again, that contributes to the quality of light that comes through and how much comes through. They would um, have water and fog proofing, and then they have eye relief, which is the ability uh, to adjust this back end and adjust it for um, glasses or long eyelashes um, and help keep your um, eyes from getting too close uh, to the actual lenses. Uh, if it's in your budget, it's worth spending the extra dollars for better vision. For example, somewhere, oh yeah, these. <laughs> um, <laughs> right there all the time. Um, these are Zeiss binoculars, uh, beautiful German optics. 
This has a 10 by 42 uh, lens system, has multi-layer coating to protect the lens. It's award-winning, um, beautiful, um, and they cost a thousand bucks. The thing with um, binoculars, though, to keep in mind is it's not like uh, they go out of style like your iPhone or uh, your laptop uh, every uh, few years. Um, these will last a, a lifetime and you can even pass them down from generation to generation. So the last binocular buying tip to look for are the warranties, the guarantees, and the, the merchant. It's a um, good idea to pick a reliable brand of binoculars um, and a beneficial warranty is helpful. And then buying it from a knowledgeable merchant will make sure that your optics serve you well. Consider reliable manufacturers, of course, like we featured here, Zeiss, uh, Vortex, Nikon. Um, here's a pair of uh, Nikon Pro Staff 7S's. This is a 10 by 42. Uh, these are value priced at $129. Uh, they're nice, grippy, uh, bigger. It can be a little heavier, but again, a great pair of binoculars. Carefully check those uh, warranties though. Uh, sometimes they change. Nikon used to have a no-fault warranty, but they've dialed it uh, back a bit, um, but they still have a limited lifetime warranty on their optics, but pay, pay attention uh, to that as well. Again, the better brands are gonna take better care of you, and as long as you are not too harsh on your binoculars, like I said, they can last a lifetime. If you're investing in your young birders, there are kids' binoculars that range from 10 to $40. Um, these are a pair of Carson Gid binoculars. It's a great, great way to introduce uh, children to birding. Uh, once the children are old enough, um, you can uh, invest initially in a lower cost binoculars like these um, and then move uh, up to more serious binoculars. You can hand down your binoculars when you wanna upgrade um, your binoculars, give your older ones to the younger ones, uh, the younger birders, we call this uh, cascading. Um, that's another uh, good technique. Uh, but I would encourage you to stay away from the super cheap binoculars that are really just uh, toys and are just to play with. Um, at least get some in that range, uh, price range that we mentioned. For any birder, a great mid-range starter pair are these Nikon Monarch fives right here. They're 8 by 42s They're $279. We use them in our Chirp uh, binocular rental kits. You can test them out yourself uh, if you uh, come and visit us. Um, that's a good feature of a, a good uh, retailer. They'll let you try them out. All of our um, binoculars and spotting scopes, you're welcome uh, to stop by the store and try them out. And, and that way, um, you really can't go wrong. And frankly, it's a safer way to buy them than uh, crossing your fingers and getting them online. Um, for more compact optics, there are travel-sized, uh, like these Nikon Trailblazers. These are 8 by 25s They're uh, very affordable at $84. They're um, a great pair to keep in your pocket when you're traveling. Uh, some people will keep them in their glove box, uh, keep them handy. Um, you never know, not just for birding, but I've found lots of occasions where it's uh, helpful to see what's going on a distance away and being able to zoom in is really helpful. You can go even more compact than those with a monocular right here. Uh, this is the Solo Vortex. Uh, I find that monoculars, mono, one lens, um, are great for kids because um, it's easier for their little hands uh, to handle and also they don't have to worry about um, two lenses and getting that right. It's just one uh, lens to look through. This is um, fully rubber armored. It's very durable. Um, 129 bucks. If you're birding from a long distance or in a relatively stationary position, spotting scopes are a great option. This is a Vortex Viper HD scope. It runs about $700. These have higher magnification than binoculars, and they can be mounted um, on a tripod uh, under here. Um, you could also mount it on a, a window. There's a window mount where you can put it um, on the window of your uh, car. And uh, these, again, are great for getting up close, especially if you don't have to be super spontaneous uh, with your sightings. 
All right, overall, when it comes to optics, there are a lot of options and it can seem overwhelming. That's why it's a good idea to consult with and buy from a knowledgeable, established retailer. Um, and if uh, they're well taken care of, <coughs> excuse me, like I mentioned, uh, good optics can last a, a lifetime. So a significant investment in optics makes um, good financial sense in the long run. We'd love to hear from you. Share with us what type of binoculars in the comments you have found useful. Okay, we've gone through bird identification criteria, birding guides, bird watching optics that are best for identifying birds. The final step in our how to identify birds episode is step number three, citizen science and sharing sightings. So by sharing your sightings, you can contribute to this thing called citizen science, which is where the general public shares the data that they've collected with scientists, and then the scientists use that as an important part of their scientific work and analysis. Sharing your sightings is important because these observations are helpful to scientists for them to provide historical perspective on bird populations, give information on migrations and breeding patterns, and contribute to conservation studies. So uh, eBird is an especially good way uh, to do that, and um, I'd encourage you to keep track of your sightings uh, through uh, eBird because then they get used um, by real scientists. So to record these sightings, uh, create checklists and life lists. Uh, this would be more for your personal use. You can keep track of birds you've successfully identified using um, a blank journal, uh, like this. It's compact, easy to store in a backpack, or you can use specific birding journals um, like this. Um, this one is the Sibley's um, Birder Life List and Field Guide Diary, uh, one place to keep track of all of your sightings. Uh, for younger birds, younger birders, um, who want to record bird sightings and create checklists, there's introductory um, birding journals like the Young Naturalist Sketchbook right here. Um, and there are even coloring guides like uh, the Sibley's Bird uh, Coloring Book. It's a helpful way to identify birds and exercise your creativity. One of the fastest ways then to share these sightings and participate in citizen science, like I mentioned, is via the electronic um, list apps and websites um, like eBird and uh, it keeps track of the locations, and you can enter notes, and you can even explore other birders' uh, data. I'll use eBird to get an idea of what birds I would expect to see in a particular uh, area. And one of the greatest joys of birding is sharing it in the sightings with the birding community as well as with your friends and family. So that's yet another benefit of birding. Practice your bird identification skills with a game of a bird bingo or a game of match a pair of birds. Uh, you can get the younger generations engaged with nature-themed games like Animals at Home or Who Pooped? Or even Poop Bingo. Or give the gift of birding to young ones with a young birder's gift set uh, it includes uh, kids' binoculars, a young birder's guide, an Audubon bird call, and one of our exclusive Chirp Wild Birds Love Me stickers. Whether you enjoy the peaceful seclusion of getting out in the field or the excitement of sharing birders, birds with others, one of the beauty of birding is that it can be as solitary or as shared as you prefer. So, congratulations you know how to identify birds. Doesn't that feel good? Let's review. Number one, bird identifying criteria. HSBSC, H being for habitat, S for sound, B for behavior, S for size and shape, and C for color pattern. Step number two, select high quality optics appropriate for bird watching so you can clearly spot birds from farther away. And step number three, participate in citizen science by sharing your sightings, using journals, apps, and even fun games to get others involved. Whew! We have covered a lot today. If you have any lingering questions, you can always call us at CHIRP at 888-412-4477. You can email us at 
help at chirpforbirds.com. You can visit us at our retail location in the Big Bear Lake Village uh, here in Big Bear Lake, California, and we're always happy to help our fellow birders. All right, thank you for joining us. My work is done here. Remember, full feeders, full hearts. Tori, fly us away. Well done, all of you backyard birders. Thank you again for joining yet another episode of Chirp's How to Begin Backyard Birding series. As a reminder, all of the episodes are on Chirp's YouTube channel. Also, we have walks and talks, over six months and almost 20 videos, all of this fun birding, engaging content that you can enjoy. Um, we also have, um, we want to have you subscribe to our newsletter. There we go. And get information when we start up live in the spring. So there's going to be a link to the newsletter to sign up, as well as the links for all of the different applications and websites that we mentioned. That's going to be the description of this video. Honestly, for all things Chirp, you can also go to chirpforbirds.com. Now, it is time to test your birding knowledge and take our how-to quiz. The direct link, like I said, is going to be in the video description. And the fantastic prize that you will be entered into win is a Peterson's Field Guide and a Sibley's Life List Diary. Wow, thank you so much, Joy. So go ahead and participate. And for all of you participating, we want to say thank you from Chirp to you. And you will be mailed this beautiful, one of a kind, Peace Chirp sticker. So go ahead and take that quiz. It will end soon. So there's a limited amount of time which which you can take the quiz and be entered to win those beautiful field guides and diaries as well as be entered in to win the stickers. So go ahead and take the quiz. It's honestly two minutes. Just go ahead and take it now. And no matter what, you'll be getting a sticker. So again, thank you guys so much for joining us here today. We're so happy that you were here. Go ahead and check out our other videos on the Chirp Nature Center YouTube channel. And we look forward to seeing you again soon.